In this video, I'm going to continue with the discussion of the uh, antinomies of pure reason. And so Kant starts in section three of the antinomies. Uh, so the interest of reason in these conflicts. And so essentially, why would reason want to accept any one of these sort of competing views of things? Uh, and so the task for us is to decide why reason would choose one or the other of the conflict of thesis and antithesis. And so the theses, which uh, once again are sort of the positions that there is a terminus of things, that there is like a beginning of time, uh, or that there is a simple which uh, composes all objects, or that there is a first cause, or that there is a necessary being on which uh, all other Think contingent things are contingent upon. And so the theses, he says, are attractive because they are sort of intellectually satisfying since, in, since infinite regresses are kind of unintelligible. You know, infinities are something that people have kind of a, a hard time wrapping their minds around. Uh, and so these beginnings uh, give a sort of sense of intellectual security. And so Kant cause... Uh, calls the acceptance of the theses uh, the dogmatism of pure reason. And remember that for Kant, dogmatism is somewhat synonymous with, uh, with rationalism. Uh, uh, and so it's the dogmatism of pure reason because it's based on purely rational principles. Uh, and so why reason favors these theses? So the first one is that much of our morality is based on things like freedom uh, and sort of a necessary being, like a god who gives purpose to our existence. Uh, so the second one is we find ultimate answers to our questions rather than sort of an unending chain of new questions. Uh, and then the third one he says is that these ones are sort of the most popular and easy to understand for uh, the common person. Uh, so why reason would uh, choose one of the antitheses though is they're attractive because they are simple in their uniform application of a principle. Uh, so they accord best with experience. For instance, all things are caused is not given some exception. We're not saying all things are caused except, you know, except this, you know, except some uncaused causer. Uh, because we, and we don't uh, actually experience uncaused causers in our everyday life. And so it's simple in that it's sort of, we can just apply sort of a single uh, sort of um, like a single principle and in every case there isn't any cases that are exceptions to this uh, and Kant calls this pure empiricism since it is applying the principles of experience in all instances so uh, we don't ever actually experience something that is an uncaused causer. And so we are just applying this principle of experience that all things have a cause to every uh, sort of, uh, to everything that we ever come in uh, contact with. And so why reason favors the antitheses? Uh, so Kant says that, uh, for one, that it frees us from the shackles of morality. Uh, and so the other one is neither intuition uh, nor the understanding contain anything like a beginning or terminus, but only the repeatable application of their faculties. Uh, as such, infinities of the antitheses appeal to our intuition and understanding, which themselves conceive of no beginning or end. So uh, the concepts of the understanding, there is only the, con uh, the category of cause and effect uh, there's no category for an absolute freedom. And so uh, these things appeal to sort of the categories of understanding. And that's why reason would find these sort of infinities uh, to be uh, something appealing. Uh, so then Kant in a few sections here. So in section four, he says uh, that although reason demands answers to these questions, acquiring the answers imp is impossible because these questions admit of no empirical answer. So the unconditioned always lies outside of possible experience. In section five, uh, 
Uh, he says that infinite time, space, divisibility of objects or regresses of cause and contingence. So he defines that as being sort of too large for the idea of the unconditioned. Uh, and then he says that giving these limits is too small. And so we uh, essentially can't find this sort of nice Goldilocks zone where infinities are always too big for us to really sort of comprehend. But these uh, putting these terminus, this terminus on it and saying that there is sort of, you know, a beginning to time or that there is an uncaused causer uh, sort of is too small because reason will always say, well, you know, how is the uncaused causer uncaused? Like, that doesn't make any sense why we're giving an exception to this. And so it always seems too small. Reason is always demanding some further explanation. Uh, then it, in the section six here, uh, at the end of an empirical regress, whether a terminus or an infinite regress, is the mere possibility of an experience of those things, and therefore things in themselves, uh, and, and thus can never be experienced. And so he's saying that uh, that a terminus or an infinite regress are both things that we can never experience. So. You know, if we say that there is some kind of uncaused causer, so some necessary being, that's something we can't experience. But we also can never experience sort of the, you know, the contingents. We can never experience these contingents as infinite because we can't experience an, an infinity. Uh, and then so in section seven, uh, so, which is called critical decision of the cosmological conflict of reason with itself. Uh, so Kant is saying that there is another equivocation fallacy here. If we look at our original syllogism, so if the conditioned, so object and native ex explanation is given, then the whole series of all its conditions is given as well. And so that's what I started the last video on where I talked about when we experience something, we experience it as being something that is sort of in need of explanation. But then the explanation to it is also something in need of explanation. And that explanation is also in need of explanation, uh, and so on. And so those things, those uh, explanations are are sort of given in the thing that we are actually experiencing. Uh, and so then the conditioned object in need of explanation is given, therefore the whole series of its conditions is given as well. And so Kant is saying that the conditioned in the major premise here uh, is meant in the transcendental sense, uh, since it's the presupposition of its conditions is given and therefore timeless. Uh, but the conditioned uh, in the minor premise uh, is in the empirical sense, since the conditioned here is one given in empirical intuition. And so we end up with uh, this sort of equivocation fallacy again. And so Kant also makes a uh, distinction between what he calls a dialectical and an analytical opposition. So a dialectical would be something kind of like this, uh, where we say that something uh, either smells bad or something smells good. Uh, but there is actually a third option, which is that there is no smell at all. And so this is distinguished from what he calls an analytical uh, opposition, which is, you know, either something smells good or it does not smell good. And so we're not sort of opposing two sort of, I guess, uh, assertions to sort of positive ideas. We're saying that something either is, you know, A or is not A, that it is either something or it's, it's, it's the negation of that something. And so that is uh, analytical. And then so for our antinomies here, so the dialectical is something like either the universe is infinite or the universe is finite and Kant is saying that there's actually a third option which is that the universe is neither infinite nor finite uh, where the analytical would be that the universe is infinite or the universe is not infinite uh, or that the universe is finite or the universe is not finite uh, and we can never experience the universe as a conditioned whole so the series of conditions can never be apprehended 
as a completion. And so whether it is infinite or finite is only a dialectical rather than an analytical opposition. Uh, and so that allows us to sort of take this third option here. Uh, then so Kant talks about what he calls the regulative uh, principle of pure reason. And so this is a distinction that's important for Kant, what he calls regulative. Uh, so regulative, regulative, which is as opposed to what he calls constitutive, constitutive. And so regulative is just sort of telling us how to proceed uh, using the ideas of pure reason, where constitutive is trying to say that the ideas of pure reason say something real about the world. Uh, and so the conditions cannot be given, but can be given as a task, uh, Kant says. And so that's why it's regulative. Uh, it's telling us how to proceed. So the cosmological idea is therefore not a constitutive principle, but a regulative principle guided by how we ought to proceed in inquiry. Uh, but it does not anticipate what may be given in the object prior to such a regress. And so it is not constitutive. Uh, so we take our task, however, as indefinite, which is sort of the third option here, as opposed to infinite or finite. And so indefinite meaning that you know, every time we actually come upon a case of something, we can assume, you know, sort of a, that is conditioned. Uh, and then, you know, when we come upon those conditions for it, then we can take those as conditioned. But we don't assume that this is going to be an infinite regress, but we also don't assume that this will at some point uh, end at, you know, some sort of unconditioned condition. And so we take it as indefinite rather than infinite or finite. Then so in section 9, uh, Kant gives this distinction between uh, what he calls the mathematical series, which were the first two antinomies about space and time, uh, which, uh, you know, this could be one or two antinomies, but Kant puts it as a single antinomy or the uh, composite of bodies, so uh, sort of the division of bodies. So time, space, and bodies are mathematical and that they are conditioned and the conditions are homogeneous in kind, uh, only differing in magnitude. So, you know, some small, you know, if we have some, some, some space here and we, you know, sort of cut it into smaller spaces. These smaller spaces are not different in kind from the larger space. They're only different in magnitude, but sort of, you know, I guess the, the, I guess, spaceness of it is still the same as the spaceness of, you know, the larger space. They're just a difference in, uh, in magnitude, as I said. Uh, furthermore, the elements of the series of conditions uh, are all able to be sensed. Uh, so time and space, so we can always think of the magnitude of time and space as indefinitely defi uh, defined, never as infinite nor finite. So once again, it's sort of the idea that we can look at, you know, some unit of space and we can uh, think of it as we can divide that space up into smaller spaces. Uh, but we can't sort of assume that this is, can be done infinitely, but we also can't assume that it can be, or that we will eventually get to some smallest amount of space. Uh, and so we could say the same for time as well, that, that we can divide time uh, sort of uh, finitely, uh, or we can divide, we can divide it indefinitely. Uh, into the past. So, but we can't assume that there is some beginning of time or that time ex uh, goes, extends infinitely into the past. Uh, and so we can say the same for bodies, that the divisions we can perform on some object, uh, the number is indefinite, that we can't assume a simple, but we also can't assume a, uh, an infinite regress. Then uh, the other two are what Kant calls dynamical series. So this is the cause and effect 
and these sort of contingent necessary connections are dynamical in that they are heterogeneous insofar as, for instance, an effect does not have to resemble its cause and all magnitude can be abstracted. So, you know, in causality, uh, you know, we like the effect of a, of a cause can be uh, different in magnitude from the cause, you know, sort of the butterfly effect kind of thing. So there isn't like, uh, you know, in space, when we say that we have some, you know, some, some space here, uh, then we know that, you know, what causes this space, I guess, or what determines it, what conditions it are, you know, the, the, the spaces that we can divide it into. And, you know, each one of these spaces, when we sort of add them up, uh, results in the, the entire space. And so, uh, the sort of, you know, the conditioned is proportional to the conditions of it. But this is not necessarily the case in uh, causality, for instance, where all magnitude can be abstracted. Uh, so furthermore, uh, it is intelligible that causes or necessities can exist outside of what we can sense, and so admits of empirically unconditioned yet still uh, conditioned. Uh, and so going on with this uh, dynamical series here, uh, we can further we can uh, therefore have it uh, be the case that both sides of the antinomy are true. So rather than saying that both sides are untrue, we can say that both sides are true rather than that both are untrue as before. Uh, that, so we can say of these dynamicals, so the cause and effect and the contingent necessity, that both are true rather than uh, before we said both are untrue when we, with space, time, and divisibility, we said that uh, we had to assume that infinity and sort of a terminus are both untrue and take indefinite to be the case. Uh, so in this, it, with the dynamical ones, though, we can say that both of them are true. Uh, we can have both freedom and cause and effect, for instance. So freedom exists for things in themselves, so for things in themselves which are not in space and time uh, and are the causes of appearances, but do not themselves have to obey cause and effect uh, since they are not in space and time. So the appearances which are in space and time in our intuition are subject to the laws of cause and effect. And so essentially we can think of, you know, maybe there is some, you know, some object that exists in itself and you know i'm drawing it as spatial here but it's it's not necessarily spatial uh and so then we have our sort of you know our time here t1 to t2 to t3 where cause and effect is taking place but this thing existing outside of time is conditioning you know what's happening at time t1 and it's con uh, conditioning what's happening at time T2 and what's happening at time T3. And so you could almost think of this object in itself as being the condition of causing, uh, of causing our sense of causality because causality is how we experience, uh, how we experience the passage of time here. And so this object in itself, which, uh, like I said, I drew it spatial here, but it's not spatial. It's not existing in space or in time. It's actually sort of conditioning or determining uh, sort of uh, the actual experience of causality itself, uh, even though it is not itself uh, sort of um, subject to cause and effect. Uh, and so reason uh, is not an appearance, but acts as a cause of human action, which is in appearance. Uh, thus, humans are both free and determined. Uh, so reason, so the ideals of reason uh, are ideal. Uh, they're actually transcendental uh, ideas because they exist outside of space and time. You know, sort of the idea of... of uh, you know, the soul, for instance, uh, is the same today as it was yesterday and so forth. 
Uh, and so reason is not an appearance, so it's not something phenomenal, but it does act as a cause of human action. So reason is acting as a cause of human action, uh, where the human action itself is an appearance. And so humans are both free and determined. Uh, so humans can think counterfactually, while objects subject to cause and effect uh, can only be what they are. So a circle is a circle, but nothing in cause and effect can say that it, what a circle uh, ought to be, uh, or I guess uh, cause and effect might not be the best one to use here. This would actually almost be uh, the sort of necess necessity in contingency uh, sort of uh, idea. Uh, so a circle is a circle sort of, uh, you know, but nothing in uh, cause and effect, uh, nothing in sort of uh, necessity and contingency can say what a circle ought to be. Uh, humans, on the other hand, can think of how things ought or ought not be. Uh, and so that's actually important for uh, Kant's later philosophy about morality, which uh, I will not be getting into in this video. Uh, I, in the future, I'll probably do a separate uh, series on Kant's uh, uh, moral philosophy and his uh, groundworks on the metaphysics of morals and in his critique of practical reason. But uh, the, the idea here is that because we can say that we are both free while also that, uh, that we are subject to cause and effect, um, uh, is is sort of important for Kant's later uh, moral philosophy. Uh, but anyway, so Kant says that this does not prove that humans have free will, but shows only that it does not conflict with uh, the causality of freedom. So, uh, so these antinomies don't conflict with the idea that we have free will. Uh, and so therefore, having free will is compatible with uh, the sort of thoroughgoing cause and effect of, of our phenomenal experience. Uh, and then so, too, here, the impossibility of a necessary being cannot be inferred from the contingency of everything in appearance, uh, as there may be a necessary being in the realm of things in themselves. And so that's sort of the same as the, with the causality, that this necessary being could be something outside of experience. You know? So therefore, the fact that we never experience anything as being necessary, we never come across anything in our day-to-day -day lives where we think uh, if we're, it's impossible for us to think that that thing existing is impossible. Uh, and so we never come across anything in our experience that is absolutely necessary, but uh, something existing in the realm of things in themselves could be, uh, which is, you know, outside of experience, could be absolutely necessary. And therefore, an absolute necessity is not incompatible with uh, the fact that we experience everything as being contingent. Uh, and so, yeah, that is the end of this part on the antinomies of pure reason. Uh, and so kind of the take-home message here, I guess, uh, is that the, um, you know, that we have the, the space, time, and then uh, the divisibility of bodies are sort of the mathematical series. Uh, and so these are the things that uh, the antinomies are both untrue, and so we're saying that they are, uh, that, you know, space, time, and the divisibility of objects are indefinite, uh, but not infinite and not finite. So infinite and finite are untrue, and we have to accept an indefiniteness to it. Whereas with the dynamical ones, we're saying that both sides of the antinomy are true, you know, so essentially that we are free, but also uh, subject to uh, cause and effect, uh, and that, you know, everything we come in contact with is contingent, uh, but that there could be a necessary uh, being. Uh, but anyway, those are the antinomies of pure reason, which uh, have to do with what Kant calls the world whole. So as I said before, the paralogisms had to do with sort of the human soul, uh, so in the antinomies have to do with uh, with the world uh, 
uh, the world whole. So, you know, that's why I was talking about things like space, time, you know, bodies, cause and effect, uh, and things like that. So it has to do with sort of, you know, the things out there in the world. Uh, so in the next, uh, what will probably be three videos, uh, I'm going to uh, get into what Kant calls the ideal of pure reason, which uh, brings in him into his sort of famous refutations of the uh, of these sort of popular arguments for the existence of God. Uh, but anyway, that will be in the next, uh, like I said, probably three videos. So uh, I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next one.